everybody. Welcome back to Sector One, the first stop you should make for your motorsport fix. Today, I'm joined by our tech expert, Jacob, and we also have Kathy with us. Some of you may recognize her from TikTok. But um, yeah, we're going to do a little video about what it was like to go to Silverstone. So I was there a weekend. I believe Kathy was there a weekend. Jacob was there on Saturday. But yeah, we're just going to talk about where we were sat, what we saw. And then just have a discussion about some of the some of the sessions. So, Jacob, do you want to kick us off and tell us where you yeah. went, what you did, what was going so, on? So, general admission ticket, got a lot of that. Um, so, went all over the track. So, for the first F2 race on Saturday, I was sat at Luffield. Nice view there. Nice view of Samaya spinning out and the crane picking him up. He waved at me, I think. Good. <laughs> then walked around to chapel for the f1 practice session then to beckett's for w series and uh, yeah w series and then round to cops for the f2 race and spring qualifying cool kathy where were you sat i was this is my first time going to Silverstone, so i didn't really know that obviously we could walk around the track but so we found out on Saturday. So I we stayed in Stowe. So we stayed in Stowe Block A, which was brilliant because we saw a lot of overtakes from the weekend. We also saw obviously Ben Viscal getting hit. And then obviously, obviously coming off in the track for the perfect view. We also saw when um the GT Masters race, when the two Daytonas collided, like right towards the end. We saw that spin and it was and a couple of other cars came off. But yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. I think one of the perfect spaces we could see all the way up to um Beckett's. Of like the outskirts of cops and then all the way down to Vale and obviously the left hander and into the pit lanes. So it was a very good spot to sit. Yeah, so I was there um all weekend. On Friday we were at Luffield. Uh we watched I think pretty much everything we were at Luffield, um, which was a great spot. You got because it's quite a slow corner, so you got a good view of the cars, which was you know good for the first day. And I've not been since 2011, so I've not really seen this sort of era of cars um, up close. Um, and then what else did we do that day? I can't remember. Well, we basically stayed at Larfield uh, for all the sessions. We had a bit of a wander um, elsewhere, but in terms of actually watching, we watched from there. On the Saturday, we were at COPS um, for the F2 um, and the practice session. We walked up um, to kind of Beckett's I saw Jacob uh, for the W series and then just back to Cops. And then on Sunday, we were sat at Vale, which was a really great spot. We saw everybody coming in the pits. Um, we saw Kimmy and Checo have a little bit of a collision, mm -hmm. um, some close overtakes in F2, which was good as well. So, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend Vale was good. It was quite busy at Vale. There's a lot of people crammed into one area, but I guess you're going to get that. Kathy, I was going to ask you about Fridays. Um, obviously, it's usually not that much of a busy day, but from what I've seen online, obviously I've not been um, in recent years and neither of you, but from what people are saying and online and stuff, Friday was so much busier because of quali yeah. on the Friday. I mean, we got there quite early. So we ended up, because I was staying at the Waterside Village University, we ended up coming quite early. And it was definitely busier. And obviously like progressively through the day and because qualifying was quite late so like six or seven it was definitely like a noticeable <clears throat> sorry like more people were there and more people came to watch the junior series because obviously while you watch on tv i think watching like the w series practice sessions and obviously what they are qualifying and seeing like the f2 qualifying there was noticeably more people and it felt nicer to have the short practice and you know, see drivers actually push the cars to the proper limit and then see the qualifying later Actually, more bulk to, to Friday, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I think quali is one of the most exciting sessions of the weekend. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of like actual, I mean, aside from the race, well, actually, it was pretty exciting the whole weekend, but like quali specifically, yeah. when, you know, Lewis got pole at the end was just like mm. crazy. Because obviously, well. yeah, with George, just being like with the British crowd, Amazing. literally everyone went nuts. That was that was um, pretty cool. But yeah, talking about qualifying, I thought we'd have a little chat about sprint quality because we were all there to, to watch it. Jacob, what were your what were your thoughts? 
I think, so I was sat at Cots and Lewis and Matt, they got quite close in that first lap. I thought they were going to crash from where I was sat, the angle. I was actually sat right in front of where Max hit the barrier on the Sunday. So that's where I was sat for the Saturday. And it was great to see them all come through. And as the nerd I am, just seeing the cars load up, you could see how, like, if you imagine the cars are like that, how they was tilted on the downforce loads through cops. And that was just amazing to see. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think a lot of people weren't expecting that much of an exciting race. They were like, you know, yeah. people have got a lot to lose. They're not going to go crazy. But I think the people that have maybe not qualified as well as they wanted to are obviously going to be pushing. And I think that kind of balances it yeah. out because it forces the people up the front to, you know, they've got to defend, they've got to, you know, maintain that position. And they can only do that by by racing hard anyways. Cathy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I like I came into it with kind of an open mind because obviously watching F2 like this, like last year, I really got into it and the junior series. And I was really optimistic to see how it would work in F1. I saw a lot of like negative like images towards it. And I actually, I loved it. <laughs> like even people, like, there was not much change at the front. I think we all knew there was going to be a Lewis and Max battle and then they'd run away with it. And then it'd be more down to the midfield. You know, like we had some stunning performances like Alonso's, you know, on soft tyres to do what he did to go longer yeah. than he said he would and to push that hard was fantastic like Kimi making up places as well it was definitely interesting to see people like that that don't really get the recognition they deserve and obviously then seeing like the signs and Russell incident I think it was it was just very like interesting to see how the dynamic would work and I feel like personally it did work because it pushed the drivers to be on their game which is why I think that Daniel Ricciardo actually clicked because it was the short format get it done go just go all in if you mess it up you mess it up and I think that's what F1 needs at the moment yeah yeah it's a bit of like accountability for for yourself as well because obviously if you have an incredible I guess Friday now if they're going to be continuing that I don't know but if you qualify really well you've got so much to lose but equally you've got so much to gain and that dynamic between that the two sort of types of drivers I guess is what is what makes it interesting but I was having a think and I know a lot of drivers weren't happy with the fact that like all of their hard work on the Friday could be taken away in an instant someone like Sainz who you know it wasn't his fault that he was then dropped right to the back and lost yeah. so many places I wondered whether they would kind of adapt some sort of F2-ish um, format in that if all of this is just being done for the entertainment purpose if they just do like a sprint race where the top 10s reversed or something like as they do in in formula two if they would consider something like that so that qualifying is still a pure qualifying for the race if drivers are concerned about that jacob do you have any, any oh, that'd thoughts? be great because that would have been what george russell and Vettel on pole oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah i think yeah because f2 the first race in the morning compared to the second race there's so little action in the first race because you don't want to if you crash into someone on lap one of the first F, f2 race you could be out for the rest of the weekend if you've got big damage but and so i guess some drivers could have adapted some drivers are thinking okay we'll just hold stock but then at the same time if, if you attack really hard say perez when he spun off at chapel it then gives him the whole Grand Prix to try and claw it back. Because if he did that lap one of the lap in the main race, he's screwed for the rest of the race. But it gave him a try. It gives you also almost a redemption. Yeah, and I think Science was saying that like, although he was literally last, or he was pushed back to to last in the sprint, he really enjoyed coming back through the field. And if yeah, you know, yeah. it shows that a you can overtake if you know, you've got the moves and you've got the got the skill you can overtake. We can't really use that argument anymore, at least for some cars. Um, but yeah, if it makes it more exciting for the drivers, it's then more exciting for the fans in in theory. So yeah. is it, there's another round they're doing? I think there's two more. Monza and I, I, Interlagos. Right. Monza's been confirmed. Interlagos is set to be the next one. I think it'll be the good. Only, yeah. The only issue I've got was, oh, 
Oh, no, you go. Serious, serious. <laughs> The only Sorry. issue I've got with sprint qualifying is it only it doesn't necessarily give as much incentive for those lower down the order because it's great that P1 to 3 get points. But if you're, say, P12, there's no real incentive for you to try and risk it on the last lap to get P11. Whereas, say, on the last lap, say, risking it to get P10 gets you, say, a point. There's more incentive to push for that rather than not push if that makes sense it's almost only rewards the drivers at the top and that's pretty much always hamilton bottas and verstappen that is so it just true. doesn't encourage mm -hmm. action lower down the so like for say raikkonen say you make up three places you've got the pace to maybe get a fourth but there's no need to risk you damaging the car the sunday's race yeah what's the point if you're already in somewhat of a mm -hmm. decent position you might as well just kind of hang around there and set yourself up for the Sunday as opposed yeah. to, you know, as you say, yeah. going for, for non-existent points. I think also, because obviously in qualifying, you have the tyre specs, you know, obviously like the path burner rules, like you've got the tyres you set your first lap in Q2, gets you obviously in the ones you start on. I feel like when, because I, was, I wasn't sure with the, with the tyre rules between all the qualifying sessions. And I feel like if they had that rule still in place, even in the race, you know, the ties that you qualify on are the ones you start the, um, the sprint race on. I feel like that would make it interesting because people, I feel like, would push more to make sure they're getting into it. But I agree, because I remember I watched an interview, it could have been 2018 or 2019. I think it was definitely with Vettel and Lewis when they asked about reverse grids. And I don't agree with, like, 1 to 20 reverse grids. I think that's silly because you end up completely compressing the pack. But for points finishes of like Jacob was saying it makes perfect sense because you know those cars can get there and the argument of well they're all going to crash well you're not going to put a hat on the front row you're going to put someone that has a decent shot of points that could be one week it could be a Ferrari one week it could be an Alpha Tower it could be a Red Bull if they fall down there and it would just be interesting to see even if they did it just for one race no championship points up for grabs just to see or maybe a few to see how it would go it would make it I feel like a lot more interesting if you did it just did it for points finishes, because you would see what they did in F2, which is do you hold on for like reverse grid pole? Do you go for the extra points? I feel like that would make it a lot more interesting. You see more tactics come into play as opposed to like even now with the normal format, which is obviously people in Q2, obviously they try to get to Q3, but it's under debate of do we go, do we stay with fresher tyres? It's just, a, I think it would be an interesting experiment to see, but I don't think it will ever happen in F1. I think mainly because F2, it's a spec series. When the when the teams get the cars from whoever makes it, it's they're identical right down yeah. to the individual suspension systems. And in F2, it does really interest me how there is such a big gap between how you've always got the likes of Prima and Unii Virtuosi at the front, and you've always got HWA at the back. It does mm. like how you've got that divide. But at the end of the day, the cars are. It's not like they can develop any parts in the car. So I guess that makes sprint grids, I mean, reverse grids a bit fairer than if it was an F1. Yeah, yeah I think the only thing, I don't think we'd ever see a serious reverse grid, full reverse grid in F1, because I think there's safety things that come into it just because of the mm. sheer pace difference between, I mean, let alone like Red Bull and Haas. Like, I think at the end of the race, the Haases are like a minute behind the Williams. And like, yeah. when you think yeah. about that in, in a big grid you can see that why drivers have um an issue yeah. with full reverse grid so i understand that but but yeah just having like the top 10 reverse as in formula two i think from an entertainment perspective would be interesting how they sort out the points and stuff i think would be a something to figure out but you know it's the first time that they've run this i think it was successful it's definitely made it's been a huge talking point it's you know mixed up the order a little bit so i could maybe see it making a return i think could i think f1 needs to obviously like have a big change because obviously i know people a lot of people said you know obviously with the argument about drs and you know just having like a drs train but i think then they, they needed to try something bold and i think people making a judgment just on silverstone silverstone is a very unique circuit it's old school but like if you look at it it's yes it's a wide track but you know 50s even before the 50s people were racing that it's not that's why I think when people try it at Monza and into Lagos, we'll get a broader picture of, well, actually, is it a good idea or is it just Silverstone was kind of a bit of a fluke? So I think people who say, you know, it was bad, they need to watch the rest of the season with it. 
because I like last year having one practice session I think it was Imola because of yeah. the way things mm. and, I loved and uh, uh, Germany to an extent yeah. yeah I liked having it because it meant that you don't go into it with as much data and it's not a data yeah. session it's a drivers obviously a lot of them haven't driven Imola obviously except the Avatari drivers obviously like test their cars there but it was very much an idea of okay go out in FP1 you know see what you've got and then go into qualifying with a really big unknown as opposed to we've got three hours of data sessions we know exactly we know what's, what's going to happen yeah yeah and that's why I think with kind of more traditional circuits quote to quote it's a bit kind of it can be a bit predictable which is why I like the sprint because you've got one hour and obviously a lot of drivers this year in new teams and even the cars are you know different similar to the 2021 cars but 2020 cars but they're slightly different and to have that one hour practice it was obvious then watching the qualifying into the sprint race then into the final race how it actually affected having only that one hour or two hours by the time on Saturday yeah I think also you could see that the sprint race is a bit more of a I mean I know it's far from a practice session but they've got a bit of race experience and for for rookies that's a big thing um, yeah to be in yeah. there in race situation I know a, a lot of drivers are like well we never really got into a rhythm um so it doesn't it doesn't border into the too much practice slash data you know they've still got some possibilities of what could happen but yeah they've then got something to kind of warm them up a bit and for someone like Daniel Ricciardo as we said maybe that was the reason that he's he did so well on the Sunday he kind of got into that quicker and as soon as he got out on the Sunday knew you know whether it was so I know where the grip is I know how to drive the car around xyz turn. in a race condition yeah exactly Just it's, it's, I think also the look, yeah I feel like with the young drivers as well so if you look at someone like obviously Mick and Mick, Nikita are kind of a bit of an exception because they're in Hasses and it's 2020 can't but if you take them away and look at someone like Russell Latifi and you look at the people who have gone through F2 recently who have done the format Charles Leclerc they benefited massively because they knew what to expect if you look at someone yeah. who's also like the oldest if you look at the Raikkonen's the Alonso's even you know back to I know, Daniel Ricciardo who haven't experienced that proper qualifying format it, I think it was a shock to a lot of people because obviously did a lot of you know the state lander for example he knew what was going to happen he knew the kind of the unpredictability of it and you needed to just get away and go and that's why I feel like it was good because it kicked a lot of people into gear it was just like short do what you can see where the race is see where the grip is see where the tires go and just see what happens thank you very much for for listening and coming on we've had a, a good old conversation about it um and yeah if you ever get the opportunity to even just go to Silverstone for a day definitely do it you won't regret it um museum at the side is brilliant yeah yeah I saw something on TikTok and it was like if you look back in 50 years and regret not spending xyz on on a Grand Prix you're not going to regret it so yeah 10 out of 10 experience would have liked if it was like 10 degrees cooler maybe but oh yeah (laughs) yeah we made it through and I'm actually not sunburned so no, we got a free tanning session, which was exactly. Nice. <laughs> I'm part of the elite club that didn't actually sunburn, so I, I jealous didn't of you, like... jealous, very <laughs> jealous here. <laughs> right, thank you all for listening. Uh, make sure to check out some of our Silverstone content. Um, there's a few of us that were able to go uh, over on at Sector One Podcast. But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this little mini video slash podcast and enjoyed the race. <laughs>